let's start off with worker co-ops, which is something that you talk about on your show, Economic Update, very frequently. Uh, and our show, Act Out, is very critical of capitalism. Uh, and it seems to me that this that, that worker co-ops are an interesting entity because it seems to me that they're both the way to deal with a capitalist empire in decline while also building an alternative uh, for the future. Yes, that's exactly why it attracted uh, me and people like me. In a way, capitalism is now so much a system spinning out of control. Uh, to take just as one example, the, the tax bill just passed by the Congress of the United States uh, at the end of 35 years of relentless growing inequality that makes the United States today the most unequal society of all the industrialized developed countries. At the end of a period like that, when you have effectively been redistributing wealth from the bottom and the middle to the top, to pass a tax bill that does that aggressively is ethically unjustified, morally unjustified, and makes absolutely no economic sense at all. It isn't necessary. It isn't uh, a corrective measure. It's simply a way of making worse something that's already a problem, which is even more weird when you remember that the last presidential election was run by everybody promising to save the middle class from further erosion, it, it's, it, it passes over into the ludicrous. So anyway, capitalism is in a way deconstructing itself. It's falling apart. It is proving every day to more people that whoever it benefits, it doesn't benefit the majority of folks. But you're also right, and that's very crucial for us, that there has to be part of any critical movement has to be a plausible plan for something at least to try that could work better. You don't have to provide guarantees. Nobody really can anyway, but a, but a plan and, a, and a, a way forward. Now, we don't think we can offer the classical socialisms, partly because the Russian and Chinese and other examples didn't work out all that well, to say it politely, and partly because so much effort has been devoted over the last 50 years to persuading Americans and others that there's nothing there or that it's evil or something like that. So that's kind of a blocked area for us to go for both those reasons. But the history of the world and even our own country gives us an alternative way, a way to understand that we could have a radically different economic system if we applied the commitment to democracy we pretend to have as a nation to the most important place it could be applied, namely the workplace. I like to stress to people, you know, five out of seven days, the best hours of those days, we're at work as adults. We're using our brains and our muscles to try to make a good product or a good service or whatever it is we're engaged in. And we claim to be democratic, but we never organize that. We never did as a nation. We go into a workplace, we cross the threshold, and suddenly somebody tells us where to sit and what machine to use and what to do and how to do it and for how long to do it and at what pace to do it. And we have no control over this at all. Basically, those people, if they're not satisfied with how we perform, can take away from us the job, our livelihood, throw our families and ourselves into crisis. So this is a system that isn't democratic and that isn't working for most of us. It's almost a no-brainer then to say, let's try to democratize the enterprise. Let's try to apply the idea that everybody at a workplace, a factory, an office, a store, is part of a community, the community that makes this workplace successful, that produces a decent output for the consuming public, and that produces a decent experience for all those human beings that come and give themselves each day to this activity. And let's organize it, one person, one vote, to democratize the, the experience. And I'm convinced, and you know, I'm an economist, so I study this sort of stuff, that this would produce a better outcome for the majority of people than what we have today. It would distribute income much more equally. I mean, no way on earth 
would a collective of workers, say 200 in some place, decide to give the top executive all the money in the world to have three McMansions, while everybody else can't send their kid to college because they're in debt up to their eyeballs. It's not going to happen. And we're not going to use in the factory toxic technology because we all have to breathe that air and our children do and our neighbors do. We're not going to do that because we're not wealthy people living a thousand miles away in a gated community with artificial air that they can breathe. You know, if you think about it, it is a good alternative. Co-ops have been around a long time. All kinds of parts of the American community, farmers, African-Americans in the South, others have made real efforts. Uh, they're as old as this country is. And here is a way to learn from an earlier experience of collective and community production. So I think it's a way forward. And I'm very pleased to let you know that it's overwhelming the response that we're getting as we run around the country trying to say, let's try this alternative. Although I admit, Mr. Trump is a great organizer for us. Um, he makes people so upset and so angry. So do the Republicans. And so, do, to be honest, the Democrats, too, as they go along, you know, weekly with all of this, that people are looking for an alternative and we have one uh, to offer. Yeah, it's also interesting this idea that, uh, you know, we're fed this concept that capitalism is part of democracy, democracy is part of capitalism, when in reality, like you said, the fact that we spend the majority of our lives in a completely undemocratic uh, paradigm, our workplace, just speaks to the fact that capitalism is not uh, is not a democratic system at all. It's it's a very hierarchical authoritarian system by, by design. Um, so I want to talk about, with that with that same concept of co-ops in mind and also with our with our economy because as the baby boomers continue to age our economy is having a harder time taking care of them and our economy is buckling under their needs and something that you've talked about on your show is the, the the this idea of the silver tsunami and how people who are now retiring from their businesses can use the co-op model to not only make themselves feel better about not not shutting down their business, but also in a way to bolster the economy and also their the people that work for them. Talk about talk about the use of co-ops in this transition in the silver uh, tsunami, and also how that could possibly bolster our, in particular, our local economies. Sure, I'd be glad to. First, just a word on this notion. You know, we are an aging population. That's nobody's fault. It's when people decided to have children, given the circumstances that they faced. Um, and so anyway, we have a population now that is becoming older. And it means very interestingly, as I discovered this over recent years, that there are literally tens of thousands of folks entering their mid-60s, more or less, who've spent a lifetime, in many cases, building up a business a store here, a factory, an office, a service of one kind or another. And this is true in every one of the 50 states across the country. And so they reach this interesting point when they're deciding what they now want to do. They really don't want to spend the remaining years of their lives working, you know, 18 hours a day on building this business. They love it. They feel very grateful that it worked out for them. Uh, but they want to do something else. You know, they want to retire. They want to travel. They want to do whatever. And likewise, they have children who have gone on to do other things, children who don't want to do what their parents did. Um, and so they reach this kind of a crisis. What are we going to do? Let me give you an example in Wisconsin. This was a, a factory that had employed about 300 people. And this husband and wife had built it up together and they were in exactly this situation and they didn't want to close the thing for two reasons. It would be disaster for the 300 families and not just for those individuals who lost their job and not even just for their immediate families, but those people would then have no money, couldn't buy in the local stores, would thereby cripple them. Uh, the factory would go out of business so it wouldn't pay taxes to the local community who couldn't therefore fund their schools. I mean, you could see the ramifications of this. And the Midwest is full of examples of companies that have moved or closed. So they didn't want to do that. They didn't also, to be honest, and they were very honest with us, 
They didn't want to end their lifetime of work by closing the factory. That was not what they had done it for. So both for themselves and their sense of their own achievement and for the 300 people, many of whom they knew personally because they hired them over the years, they didn't want to close it. But they also didn't want to sell it to another company because it ran the same risk. That company could then close it. And that company would have none of the feelings and the commitment and the relationships with others. And likewise, they didn't want to you know, become a public company and sell stock because, again, it would have the same risk. And they didn't know where to turn. And they were very upset. And when we encountered them, we were the bearers of, of good news for them that they didn't even know about, which is there really is an option, which is sell your company when you're ready to stop, to your own workers. Make it into a co-op. And look at what that does. One, it keeps those people working. It saves their jobs. Number two, it saves the larger community because the working people are continuing to work and continuing to earn. And so they have purchasing power. And finally, it saves the community from what might have been a devastating loss of tax revenue coming from the, all of this activity. So it is an enormous, much better it made this couple much happier to know it. It raised really only two questions. One, can the workers do it? Can they run their own business? And number two, how could they get the money, the workers, to buy the thing from the couple that was ready to sell it? And it turns out there that two things have been shown to be true. That if you give a group of 300 workers Basically, the following option, you can either lose everything, your job, your ability to make your mortgage payment, everything, or you can step up and become not just a worker in this place, but a director, an owner, an operator. It'll take more out of you, but it'll make your work life infinitely more interesting, will give you the standing and, and power that comes with being self-determining. And there's no question, given that choice, it's a bit of a no-brainer, of course. Doesn't mean they'll always succeed, but the commitment, the drive, the pressure, it's all there to make it work. And the second thing we discovered with them is that there are lawyers, accountants, and banks in the United States that have been doing this kind of thing quite a while, so that there isn't a desert of no money. There is a there are ways of raising money, both in the usual way, bank loans and so on, but also in new emerging ways. Uh, local churches that see a commitment to the community and to the parishes they serve as including raising money. And that gives you a new ally. And then there's the one I like the most. I'll admit it to you. It's a little bit uh, harsh, but let me put it to you as nicely as I can. I have had good times going to visit local political leaders in these situations. They could be a mayor, they could be a congressperson, could be a senator, could be a governor. And saying to them, look, um, I'm here with such and such a company from such and such a town in your district. We are prepared to make you a very good offer. If you give us a tax advantage, if you give us a subsidy, if you give us some help, the very thing to the co-op that they have always given to capitalist enterprises throughout the history of the United States. If you just give us the kinds of things you always gave them, we will let everybody know. You will be a hero in this district. You will be reelected with great enthusiasm because you can have helped keep these jobs, keep this income, keep this thing flourishing. And then I lower my voice and I look a little bit out of the side of my eye and I say to this same, it's usually a man, of course, uh, say to this politician, and if you don't help us, I wish you well in running for dog catcher the next time around. Because we will tell everybody that we came to you, we asked for the same help for a worker co-op that you have routinely given and have your predecessors to capitalist enterprises and at the risk for 300 families, etc., you say, no, this will haunt you, dear sir. 
you know, most of the time I don't even have to finish that last part <laughs> because they know because they've been in that situation mm-hmm. with capitalist enterprises. It's just a little new for them to understand that the same pressures apply here and tell you what you get the help. So with the in, passion of the workers, which the commission and uh, the commitment of the people selling with the support of lawyers and accountants who like to do this, economists like me who will offer free services, and the help of politicians who really have no choice, you've got the ingredients to take this quite a ways down the road to see what it could do. So the co-op, I mean, the co-op model is something that can be used in any sort of business. And what you were talking about, you know, speaking to politicians, have you seen, uh, in your experience, have you seen barriers that have been put up against co-ops, both on the political level, the economic level, uh, even perhaps a social level, to go against the co-op model um, in in places that you've seen? Uh, You're absolutely right to think that, I mean, that's the right question to ask. The answer may surprise you. No, we haven't. And the reason we haven't is I think most people still see the co-op as a kind of quaint, maybe old-fashioned, maybe a little cuddly, you know, a kind of nice warm thing that isn't scary yet. I don't think regular businesses are quite yet up to seeing the co-op as an alternative, as a potential competitor down the road. Uh, I fully expect, though, that you are right, that as we get momentum going, as the as this logic begins to spread across America, uh, and as uh, capitalist businesses see this as an alternative, they will turn against it, they will push against it, they will do all kinds of things, legal and otherwise, uh, to slow it or to stop it. My hope, I, you know, I'm all full transparency here. My hope is that we will have enough momentum that their their effort to stop it will be too little and too late. Uh, but am I sure? No. But I think you're right that and we have it in our heads that this down the road. Let me give you an example, though, of how this can work. The best example of successful worker co-op in the world right now is something called the Mondragon Corporation. This is a, a corporation in Spain started in 1956 with a Catholic priest and six workers in a poor northwestern corner of uh, Spain called the Basque region. It's a, it's a group of people with their own language, and but it's part of Spain and has been for a long time. Anyway, this priest made a funny joke one Sunday in church, and he said to his parish, if we wait for capitalists to come down here to, to, to employ us as working people, we will all die of old age before it happens. Everybody laughed. And then he, then he delivered the punchline, which was, let's not wait. Let's become our own employers. In other words, let's set up a co-op, which he did in this little town of Mondragon in northern Spain. Okay, fast forward to right now, 2017. Uh, it is the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. It employs over 100,000 workers. Uh, It is run by those workers who own it, who operate it, who direct it. They are a family of about 250 individual co-ops producing all kinds of goods and services. Um, To give you an idea, once a year, there's, I mean, they meet more often, but once a year, there's a big assembly and they decide whether to renew the contracts of the managers they hire. In other words, Instead of the managers hiring the workers, it's the workers who hire them. Just try to get your head around that. Give you another example. They voted that the highest paid worker in Mondragon cannot get more than eight times the lowest paid worker. Well, in the United States, the the CEOs get 300 times what the lowest paid workers do. Just to give you an idea, they don't have the inequality that we have, and here's a simple way they've solved that problem. Uh, this corporation went from six workers in 1956 to over 100,000 now because it proved its ability to grow. It proved its ability to compete with capitalist enterprises making the same things and to win that competition. In other words, it's a company that showed that worker cooperatives 
can be as efficient or more efficient in producing quality output at good prices than can capitalists. They put to rest the notion that the co-op is a cuddly, lovely thing, but can't kind make it in the tough market. Not true. And here's the funny part of it. Two American corporations have, over the recent years, partnered with Mondragon because not only does Mondragon grow and is it a successful corporation, but it has set up its own university to train people on how to run co-ops, full curriculum. I've been there. I've met those professors. Um, and they've also set up their own laboratories to do research, to come up with new products or to techniques. And two American companies were so taken with the quality of their scientific research that they pay Mondragon to allow their American engineers to work alongside them in their laboratories there in Spain. And I thought people watching or listening to the program might be interested to know that the names of those two American corporations are Microsoft and General Motors, just to give you an idea. So you, you can see that a co-op can make it can make it in a capitalist society, can compete, can win, can grow. I mean, any capitalist enterprise that said it went from six people in 1956 to 100,000 now would be written up in every business magazine as a spectacular success. Uh, that it isn't done, that most Americans probably never heard the name. Well, that goes to your earlier point. There is the beginning of an anxiety that this really is an alternative that can mean a lot to people in the in the quality of the of the work life they have and in the security of the job. And it could also be the um the, the like the scale issue that uh for example Dunbar's number speaks to the idea that human beings work best in groups of 150 or more because we haven't evolved to deal with more than that many people on sort of like a flat structure level. So how can co-ops grow to a hundred and a hundred thousand people without uh, falling prey to some sort of system of hierarchy. Right, Dave, that's something that's debated all the time at Mondragon and is part of why when I say it's a corporation with a hundred thousand, I quickly add it's a family of 250 because in a way they're grappling with the point you make. What is the size that works? And you know, they, they deal with that in the way that it ought to be dealt with. How efficient are we if we get larger? Even if we were efficient in the way you measure efficiency as how many outputs per hour, is it efficient in terms of the quality of the work experience? Because that's as important to them in a way that a capitalist enterprise doesn't care. It runs it at the top and tells everybody else what to do. You can't do that in a co-op. So they're concerned with making the experience of the workplace as important for themselves, for the children that are coming up and looking for jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So they may very well, and in some cases they already have, reach the decision that they won't grow beyond a certain level. They will seek efficiencies in other ways. In other words, not by growing, but by, for example, in Mondragon is, is wonderful. Everybody was trained to save energy. And here's what it meant. When you went, even a little detail, when you went to the bathroom, I noticed the lights in the bathroom are always off. Only when you go in there to do your thing, do you turn the light on. And then when you're done, you turn it off. And that's a, a collective commitment to minimizing electricity use. You don't need the lights when no one is in there. And here's how this should be done. And They all did it, and they all did it because they all understood that their job security, the efficiency of their production, would be enhanced. The same is true if you see a dripping faucet. The same is true if you see uh, an insect where an insect shouldn't be. If you uh, notice some problem in the parking lot, if you know, it becomes, you know, it's the old adage that Americans understand. If it's yours, you will give more of yourself to it. That's why we like to think that it's a nation where we can give people their own home because it will mean more to them and they will care for it with more attention and more. Well, if that's true for your home or your bicycle or wherever else, then it's true for your business too, since in the end you depend more on that job and its viability than you do on your bicycle or whatever else. 
that you will care for more. And I think Mondragon, again, is proof that you can find efficiencies in ways that do not undercut the humanity of your work experience, the way you interact with other people. You know, there's also the idea that work should not be, as it is in America, a kind of fundamentally unpleasant thing that you endure to get the money so you can go to the mall. There's this idea that compensation for your work is consumption. is kind of outrageous when you think of it. It's kind of a way that capitalism has made workers not think they're entitled to say, a place where I spend most of my adult life should be a place where I can build and find relationships that are meaningful to me, where I can continue to learn, where I can develop my skills and interests, where I can be uh, interacting with other people in ways that are exciting. These are perfectly reasonable human demands uh, that you make, and there's no reason why they don't apply at the workplace. In fact, the only reason they're squelched now is for the profit of those that own these enterprises. And if that were changed, and if you had worker co-ops, a different logic would shape all of this. And with that, I think that's a good uh, a good segue into uh, what I wanted to talk about regarding automation, um, because there, there's a lot of controversy around this. The idea, why not let machines do repetitive or menial tasks so that humans can pursue more creative and stimulating endeavors? Uh, the only problem is, of course, that as of right now, the automation, the gains from automation go directly up to the 1%. It's not at all split between the workers in any way. And you've mentioned before that you'd like to see the what employers should do is allow their workers to work half the amount of time, but still keep the same amount of money that they were making. Why not go the extra step and say, hey, the machines can do the checkout job uh, fine, so we actually don't need the workers at all. Go pursue your dance passion or whatever, and you still get this uh, a, a basic income, and you don't have to do the checkout counter at CVS anymore. Absolutely. The whole notion of how you handle technology is a spectacularly good for us example of the benefits of a worker co-op. And the way I do it is give a simple example. Suppose you have a new machine that can do, just for simplicity, exactly the work that half your workers used to do, whatever it is, checking out or moving a part from here to there or changing the shape of something. And so now you face the question, well, we, we used to have a thousand workers, but with these machines, we don't need a thousand workers. We only need half as much work because machine does the other part. For the capitalist, this is wonderful good news, and the capitalist immediately knows what he or she is going to do. They're going to fire half their workers. Why? Because they can get the same output, they can sell it at the same price, bringing in the same revenue they had before, but they have one big fat change they have half the wage bill they used to have because they fired half the workers. And that half of the wage bill that they used to have to give workers, they get to keep as enhanced profits, bingo, and they're off to the races with their extra profit. They love technology. They love new technology because for them, that represents profit improvement, which is the way they survive and grow. And of course, historically, you can see why workers have been frightened by technology, because it's used in a way that just lost half the people there, their income, their job, their future, their family crisis that comes from this, etc. So I like to point out, let's take a slowdown here, ask the question again. The machines allow you to have half as many workers as before, but that also means you could solve the same problem by saying, bring in the machines and we will all work half as long as we did before. That would mean, and we could do the arithmetic and I can show it to you, you'd pay the workers the same, you'd have the same output, which means you'd have the same cost for the employer as before, the same revenue, and the same profits. In other words, bringing the technology in would not enhance his profits, but it wouldn't diminish them either. Meanwhile, it would have converted the workers into a situation where half their day was liberated. 
half their day is now free. That would be using the same technology for the liberation of the workers rather than the profits. Now, I could see an argument. I mean, I like it that way, but I could see an argument. It should be shared. Yeah, but the only way it's going to be shared between the employers and the employees is if there's a mechanism to decide what portion of the benefit from this technology will accrue in the form of higher wages and what portion will, excuse me, higher profits and what portion in greater leisure for the workers. That's never done because in capitalism, the decision about what to do is left entirely in the hands of an unaccountable undemocratically selected uh, management or control of the company. So I would argue in a worker co-op, you could precisely sit down as a regular rational manner and say, we have these new machines. Let's see now. We can move people, first, your point, away from drudgery and mind-numbing repetitive activity, if that's what the technology frees us up no longer to do, get those people out of that situation into a better one. And secondly, let's reduce everybody's hours because we don't need them the way we did before. And we can decide as a co-op, do we want to have people cut all back their hours so we're exactly where we were before in production with the new machines? Or... Let's use the machines to increase the output a little bit in order to sell more goods and earn more money and do more things in this enterprise. This then becomes a rational conversation among a community of people who will democratically decide what path to take. And I think it allows us to make it simple, to use technology for the first time in a democratic way to enhance the quality of life of all the people involved in production. That has never been done before. We've allowed technology to be financed, to be driven, and to be utilized for the sake of a very small minority that own these enterprises, and the rest of us all have to live with the consequences. And and let me drive it home one more way. For 500 years, we have justified technological change on the grounds that it liberates us from long hours and hard work and drudgery. Today, my I have two children, and, and both my young adult children work more hours than I did when I was their age. The, the, this promised relief from exhausting, physically exhausting and mentally exhausting labor, this is a false promise. It was made to, to, to my children's generation And they're being told, oh, no, 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 you you want a job here. You have to work weekends and long hours and all the rest of it. It, It's kind of a mockery that technology could have liberated. But under capitalism, as you put it, it went to higher profits and the promise of of less hard work uh, was never delivered. So what are your thoughts on this idea, taking it one step further? Let's say that automation, uh, because this is something that, that people are also talking about, that automation will just make certain jobs obsolete altogether. So not just half the workforce, the entire workforce is then obsolete. In that situation, what would you what would be your feelings on something like a universal basic income to, to make up for that and make sure that those profits aren't just going to the, the top 1%? Yes, well... I can think of nothing more wonderful than having all drudgery kind of taken care of by uh, machines. I come from a generation where the classic story that we told ourselves about that years ago was when it was discovered, and I know this to be true, that the technology to make a light bulb many years ago was in place basically to make a light bulb that would last like for 70 years. That You'd plug it in, you know, you'd screw it into the socket, and it it wouldn't burn out in the way we're used to with light bulbs for, for longer than the rest of your lifetime. So you'd do it once in your lifetime, and then it would be your children or your descendants' problem, but not yours. Um, and then we were told the story that GE or Sylvania, whoever the companies were that knew this, Uh, systematically squelched all of this because for them, it was dangerous. It would mean you'd buy one light bulb and they wanted you to buy one every year, not once a lifetime. And, you know, we've heard all those stories with the refrigerator and the automobile and everything else, uh, planned obsolescence. 
as they once called it. So yes, I can see that capitalism has been a barrier to making technology work for the human race. And I would love to see it eliminate all work. And then I would have no problem, if that were doable, to basically finally do something that human beings have dreamed about for millennia, namely disconnect your livelihood from your work activity, to make work something you do because you love to, because of the relationships with others that you enter into to get a project done, because of how, whether you like those people, whether you uh, believe in the value of what this uh, collective activity do, because you can't do it by yourself. I love all of that. I would want all that. The only hesitance I have about a guaranteed basic income is if it becomes divisive in the community. In other words, if we give some people an income with no commitment for them to work, whereas other people are required to work to get an income, we are going to produce bitternesses and envies, justified and unjustified, that I think will blow us up. Uh, it, it'll be an even worse example of how the attempt to make up for capitalism's failures by having a welfare system has produced such enormous tensions over that. So I'm hesitant to do it before it's universal. I, if it were really universal, if we really do take care of everybody because we can, we, we physically have enough knowledge and resources to give everyone the basics of food, clothing, shelter, and so on, then I'm all in favor of it. I just don't want to see it as a kind of souped up welfare system because I can see where this divides us in ways that are terribly, terribly ineffective and, and, and produce animosities that, that take long, make cut deep scars and take a long time to heal. So with the with the with the concept of policy, uh, the this idea of unfettered or fettered capitalism has always irked me a little bit because it basically sounds like a, a fettered capitalism sounds like a, a chained beast. And then the question becomes, well, why do you have a beast to begin with? Uh, so do you think that that in terms of policy, do you feel that there is policy that could be enacted to sort of fetter capitalism to the point that we can have uh, a society that's obviously not perfect, but a society that really does work for the 99% and for the particularly marginalized communities that we see today? Or is that just not something that is physically possible with capitalism? Uh, the short answer is I don't think that's possible anymore. And, and it's history that teaches me that. I don't have an ideological predisposition to that perspective. I look at capitalism as being something pretty much born in the 17th century, roughly in England, and spreading from there to Europe and eventually the whole world. And along the way, it has provoked efforts to make it more humane, to make it less harsh, to make it more collected, to make it uh, more inclusive, all the things we know about. I mean, look at the New Deal in the 1930s. We really went a long way in this country to create social security, to take care of old people, to, as some people like to say, to create a capitalism with a human face. So if you ask me, is it possible to do that? The answer is yes. History teaches it's possible to do that. Unfortunately, history teaches that the capitalists, when you do that, immediately go to work to undo it. I mean, the last 50 years of America have been the undoing of what we call the New Deal uh, coalition and the New Deal programs that happened in the 1930s, unemployment compensation, Social Security, years later, Medicare, uh, government employment, minimum wage. And we can see literally today the Republicans particularly, but others too, picking away step by step at one or another of these things. So I've learned that what capitalism does is go in a direction that is so provocative for the mass of people that periodically they rise up and push back. And sometimes when they do that, they win and they get something improved. And then they watch as all of that is undone. So at this point, I've said, well, we've tried capitalism. We've tried to reform it. We've tried to prettify it. We've tried to fetter it in various ways to shape it. It doesn't last. Most of the time, these efforts don't work 
because of the power and money that they have at the top. But even when they do, they don't last because of the same situation. So I have had to conclude that the only way you can make the humane aspects of capitalism a basic feature, permanent and unrevocable, is to go beyond that system. Because if you leave that system in place, it undoes the efforts we make to make it more bearable. And I wish it weren't so. But when I hear people say, well, we just have to have a better kind of capitalism, my basic answer is we've been there. We've done that. That doesn't work. So, um, I finally, I want to, I want to talk about this, this idea of education, because that's something that you've done, uh, your entire adult life, as you say on your show. Um, because a lot of the ideas that we're talking about, the, the downfall of capitalism, co-ops, they're really can, they really depend on this idea of education, engagement, and outreach. But, uh, something that we don't see in higher learning is uh, this idea of co-ops or even the idea that capitalism is bad. In your professional experience as a teacher, talk about the economic uh, education and and how, I mean, even even what we've seen, for example, since the, the Powell memo came out, came out and talked about how we need to have an activist Supreme Court and we need all these liberals out of the school system. Um, talk about what you've seen in terms of economic education. Well, I will. Let me just preface it by saying, even though the picture I'm about to paint is pretty sad about openness in the curriculum of economics, at least, to all of these things we've been discovering, uh, discussing, I would say this, that I'm very hopeful because I can see other examples of issues that were similarly swept under the rug or too taboo to make part of the curriculum. I've seen when there's been a demand in the population, suddenly what was not discussed can become the topic for a classroom, the topic for a doctoral dissertation, the topic for a whole program of study at the university. Look, that's how we've dealt with African-American studies. That's how we've dealt with women's studies. That's how we've dealt with a whole raft of issues that no one used to take seriously, the whole ecological sensitivity to what we're doing to our environment. And to point to one right now, look, women and some men have been protesting against sexual abuse on the job, and they've made that a part of the consciousness of this country in a way I don't think ever happened before in the whole history of the country. I mean, I don't know exactly how this is gonna play out, no one does, but boy, have they put that on the agenda for people's consciousness. Okay. I think we can do the same for co-ops. I'm working at it. And I think for the same reason, we have a, a shot at success. Having said that, let me tell you about my education. Uh, the idea of a worker co-op as an alternative to capitalism was absolutely never brought up. It wasn't that it wasn't given much attention. Our professors acted as though that didn't exist. Even though they knew they were smart people, they knew enough history to know that that was out there. Just like they knew enough to know that women are second class citizens in this society and have been for time immemorial, and African American people likewise, etc. They knew that, but it didn't come into the curriculum. So whether I've been in an economics department, which is mostly where I've been, or occasionally taught in a business school, you have the remarkable thing, a business school, trying to tell you how a business works, which in fact told you only how one kind of business worked. It was as if you took a course in religion and all you got was, I'll pick one, Lutheranism. And you know, all day long, Lutheranism and you eventually raise your hand and you'd say, look, I'm happy to learn about Lutheranism. It's nothing that, but that's not all there is to religion. You know, there's, there's, there's Catholics and there's Jews and there's Muslims. and you, you can't call it religion unless you at least give some, you know, it's kind of no brainer. I'm now at that situation where I go to universities and I have to say at the beginning and everybody, you know, goes, gets breathless for a moment. You know, you haven't been taught properly. I mean, there's no nice way to say that. You have had stuff left out, and it's actually as interesting, maybe even more than what you learned, and you particularly have to ask the difficult question, 
Why was all this kept from me? Why was I not told this? Why was I not exposed? If it is part of American history, how come that got lost? You know, what, what, what? They mean there is a Mondragon that's very successful, more successful than most of the enterprises we study in the course that was run differently? Gee, how come you didn't tell me about that? Oh, my goodness, there are co-ops in America? Yes, hundreds of them. Really? I didn't you know, all of this. Now, let me add, and I had, um, <laughs> depending on your point of view, the good fortune or the bad luck uh, to go to fancy American universities. I went to Harvard, then I went to Stanford, and then I went to Yale. I mean, it's like a joke. I'm a, I'm a poster boy for elite education. They claim to be the best of the world, and blah, blah, blah. But those were the places where the taboo was observed most rigidly. I never was presented with anything like an analysis of a co-op as an alternative way of doing business. Worse than that, I was never presented with a systematic critique of capitalism. It was as if we were to be taught what capitalism is at the same time that we were taught how absolutely wonderful it is. It's the best thing since sliced bread. And nobody in their right mind would even spend a moment worrying about a better system. It is just so wonderful. I mean, it's as bad as I just made it out. I am not exaggerating. It really is the truth. And my teachers were good teachers often, and they meant well. This is not, these were not the shysters. But they were so wrapped up in the Cold War and the big struggle with the Soviet Union and capitalism is good and socialism is bad. And it was so dangerous for their careers to waver even a little bit from that storyline that that's all we got. And, you know, it, it's it's pathetic. It, it's 50 years of lost history in this country when we could have gone much further further in our thinking and in our practical work, had we had the balance of mind to say, let's look at the strengths of this system, let's look at the weaknesses, let's look at the strengths and weaknesses of alternatives. It's a good way to educate yourself. It gives you a wider range of options of how to solve problems. It is the smart thing to do. And since we are a smart people, as smart as anybody else, you have to really look at the external circumstances why we destroyed our own smartness here and became rigid, lopsided, narrow-minded, uh, economically untrained people. And boy, does it show. I mean, we just had a crisis in 2008, and here we are 10 years later, and the economy for most people hasn't recovered at all. And one reason is because we didn't teach people that capitalism has always had these crises, and we should have taught our students all the different ways we tried to cope. They wouldn't waste time with things that didn't work in the past. I mean, we don't have any of that. We have a cheerleader section in economics. I was taught to be a cheerleader. And most of my colleagues ended up cheerleading because it was the career path laid out for them. Some of us never found it persuasive. And here we are ending up with a little bit of a, I told you so to my colleagues. Uh, and they grudgingly admit because they went through the same courses and the same teachers I had, that it really is a sad comment for 50 years that we allowed ourselves to be so bamboozled by the environment that we lost all critical faculties, even as we said to our students, that's what we wanted them to develop.